Hello, and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. And today I'm with my good friend, Alan, a longtime pal who we go back, I'm guessing about 27 years, over 25. Oh, yeah. I think bad? I think we met in 95. Does that sound right? Yeah, yes. so 27 years ago. <clears throat> um, yeah, not quite 30 yet. When we hit 30, we'll do something big. We'll jump on a trampoline or something like that. 27 is, uh, the number is higher than I thought. Wow. Yeah, the length of Jimi Hendrix's life, right? And Kurt Cobain. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Groovy, man. Yeah, groovy. So here we are. <clears throat> We're in the, uh, in, the, in the virtual space, the virtual hangout space. Let's call it the virtual basement, shall we? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. How many times have we hung out in the basement together? Many times, <laughs> many adventures. Um, I think uh, I am but one of the people who can speak for it. Um, your basement was our staple. And then, I, I like I said, it was your basement and Jared's basement. I might have said that the last time. Those were like mm -hmm. the basement. Of that was my Madison High School basement. Mm -hmm. Life's yeah, up. yeah. No, I know there are probably a couple more basements in the neighborhood that people hung out in. And uh, I know Lonnie once said, our friend uh, Lonnie Friedman, that um, Lonnie Friedland, sorry, that uh, <clears throat> of all the hangouts that he was at, whenever he came to my basement, it was like uh, somehow there was a sense of. Um, like you're there to improve yourself somehow, even though there's a lot of goofing around and a lot of silliness, like there was some sort of sense of, okay, we're going to get better at guitar or we're going to get better at writing poetry or playing video games or something. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, there was a, there was a, I think Lou said the same thing. There was like this, like we weren't, we were being good kids, at least when we were there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe outside we weren't always following through, but I think we we kind of made it our Boy Scout, um, unofficial Boy Scout uh, a pledge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So uh, yeah, today um, for our listeners, we're just gonna kind of hang out and talk about some of our latest reading material. Uh, maybe get into a little bit of spirituality and uh, music and feeling our emotions. So uh, Alan, what have you been reading lately? I know you read a lot of books at one time. I also read several books at one time and that's just the way I roll. I guess it's the way you roll. What are some books of note that have caught your interest lately? Yeah, I'm gonna even show the books. I always carry a book bag with me. Um, which uh, the late Gilbert Gottfried was known to do as well. <laughs> no relation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then here's so here are two, no. Okay, here's one book that's the courage to be present. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, that's a book on um, Buddhism psychotherapy and the awakening of natural wisdom sweet and uh yeah that's about like how buddhism and psychotherapy like there is a a buddhist kind of approach to psychotherapy that's been popular and then the other book i can't find but the other book i'm reading is a book of poetry called um What's the title? It's um, You Were Never Broken mm -hmm. by Jeff Foster. And uh, just a terrific book of poetry. Really meaningful, very, like, just captures some of the, uh, the feelings that, peop that I can relate to and I, I think many other people can relate to. Just so um, raw and um, real 
but mm-hmm. like, but accepting. So it really interesting book. I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, how, how how thick is it? Very thin. It's very thin. I wish I could find it. I had it somewhere. But it it's 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 also it's like the poems are very understandable. They're not the kind of poems that you can have like alternate meanings for. They're very <laughs> clear. Um yeah, you know, um just the, like one thing I remember that I thought was really cool is like um you're not you're not your thoughts you're you're the listener of your thoughts mm-hmm. so kind of interesting way of you know also about being present also about you know holding whatever feelings are coming up and being with and honoring and you know um and it's 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 love from within. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you, and you said to me uh, when we spoke yesterday that poetry is not necessarily your your cup of tea, but for some reason this book is kind of speaking to you. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I I try to read poetry, but it's not like something that I usually read. But it, um, I've read his other poems. He's, I I think he just does a really good job at like really capturing, um, you know, the, the way that your mind tries to always get you to be better and think better and do better and how much, you know, of a, you know, kind of futile thing that could be for you and just being really at rest with yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you say, uh, um, it touches parts of you that any other format couldn't really reach, maybe? For sure, it has, um, because they're, di- they're digestible, they're short, and they're kind of meditations without like bringing you to try to meditate. It's just mm-hmm. like there's a, there's a release in each poem that he delivers and I wish I could find it. I, I don't know if it would be well we used to have a poetry cafe, correct? <laughs> <laughs> we sure did. <laughs> so yeah. it's uh kind of in line with what my uh poem so, yeah I was Alan for po- Alan's poetry cafe. Yeah. yeah. Alan's are- poetry for cafe. Yeah. Let me see if I had it. I thought I had it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I, I might be able to pull up uh, some of my poetry. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that because I'm, uh, in addition to my autobiography, part of the process is going through my uh, my journals. And in my journals, as mixed in with dreams and various things are a lot of poems. So I'm extracting these poems, kind of putting them together and and then editing them and cataloging them. And I definitely have a poetry book is probably will be my next book. Nice. So it's good to hear that you're enjoying poetry. A few other people I've spoken to are kind of, it's on their, you know, a little bit more on the forefront of their mind than it has been. And I'm, and I'm curious to see this guy's book. Maybe I'll pick up a copy because I want to know what modern poetry books are like. I bought one recently and, um, uh, but all the poetry books I can reference, I bought two recently, but otherwise it's everything that's on my dad's shelf, which was bought pre-1987. So that's my model, but I, I'm sure there's other ways of going about it nowadays. You know, that was pre-computer, so more or less. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm curious how to format it how people are, if they're including pictures or how much empty space, you know, all that's interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's empty space. There's, you know, it's some pages have four lines, and but um, it all like makes sense. All of mm-hmm. the, you know, the layout makes sense. It's 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 good stuff. Poetry, poetry is not usually my thing, but this has really been good too. Mm-hmm. There's a a Walt Whitman poem that I. I hand wrote one time and I uh, 
copied it. Um, you ever read any of Walt Whitman? I've read read quotes and things from him, and I know like he's got like really nice sayings, but really like wise sayings. Mind if I read you a short one, six lines or so? This is by Walt Whitman. It's called "Shut Not Your Doors," and he uh, he worked in Brooklyn, grew up in Long Island. Uh, um, yeah, he I believe it was him. I think he was gay, which was really rough at a time when you know eighteen hundreds, late eighteen hundreds. He was uh, doing writing and stuff, and really expressive human being. Um, and he worked for the Brooklyn Eagle. I think that was the newspaper he was editor for. <clears throat> and his famous book of poetry is called Leaves of Grass. Mm. So this is a, a poem called Shut Not Your Doors. Shut not your doors to me, proud libraries, for that which was lacking on all your well-filled shelves, yet needed most, I bring. Forth from the war emerging, a book I have made. The words of my book, nothing. The drift of it, everything. A book separate, not linked with the rest, nor felt by the intellect. But you, ye untold latencies, will thrill to every page. <laughs> Powerful words, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I uh, been read. Well, I've seen your Thomas Merton readings. Mm -hmm. which aren't poetry per se but have very poetic kind of sense of a poetic sensibility to it mm -hmm. and um yeah i quite enjoyed hearing those excerpts cool yeah, yeah. thank you you've been you've been reading him huh yeah uh so i think i feel tell me do you think in our conversation last year did i mention thomas Merton? do you remember that yeah, well, yeah, because I've yes. read, I've heard about Thomas Merton through Gabor Mate, because he talks about the taste of victory. Mm -hmm. like people need a taste of victory to feel like they have something to go for in life. You need to have that taste of victory. Hmm. Yeah, uh, so that was I recently checked it. That was April fifteenth, twenty twenty one, that we had our in interview. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, around that time, I started doing a daily reading of Thomas Merton, and I've continued it up till now. So like one, a today and tomorrow. So it's a book that has a reading for each day, and I read the reading for the day and then for the next day, every night before I go to bed. It's a pretty cool centering type of thing. He, he was very friendly to Buddhist thinking and to Taoist thinking, you know, although he was a Catholic monk and basically a hermit for the majority, a good portion of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty raw and honest, um, always cutting and reminding me like what is important, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, uh, and uh, in the Buddhism that I practice, SGI, Nichiren Buddhism, um, the third president, Daisaku Ikeda, who I and many others regard as a, a mentor in life, um, he he famously said uh, that um, one of the sort of downfalls of modern society, I'm paraphrasing, but is the lack of the poetic spirit. You know, like how many people on their way home from work or wherever they're coming at night, look up at the moon and compose a verse, you know, like he, he, his wishes for us as practitioners to be able to have that communication with the divine that you just want to create poetry mm -hmm. from interacting with life and nature. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting idea of poetry. It's like a demonstration of gratitude, of wonder, of of the you know the elusive nature of life. Mm -hmm. Right, it's that, like in uh, that quote from Walt Whitman, he, was, he said, like, my words are nothing, but the gist of it is everything, right? It's like this, you read it, you're like, did I read anything? But somehow you were moved 
by it in some way, right? There was like, there's nothing solid there. You can't go study it. It's not really useful. You could read it again, but it's, yeah, somehow it's, it's the gist, which is kind of magical how they, a poet can put into words something that will yeah. move you, you know? <laughs> put into words something that he says he can't put into words. It's like he's using the form to tell you that the form is not insufficient, be, really. Yeah, insufficient. But he, but he's using a form to to go beyond, mm -hmm. that, which is maybe another thing about poetry. Mm -hmm. it, it's what we have, you know. It's like one of the mediums, so why not use it? That's how I feel. Uh, also, from reading so much poetry that's been translated from Japanese, because the this third president wrote a lot of, of SGI, wrote a lot of poetry, it's always been translated, it never rhymes. So, you know, so that really redefined my, my you know, perception of poetry. I used to be stuck on the rhyming. And uh, for a good decade or more, I haven't been hung up on it. And I just write. Sometimes it rhymes because I'm in the mood, but a lot of times it doesn't. Uh, I, I was putting like a sketch together what my poetry book would look like. And I showed my mother and she goes, hey, I read your words. They're pretty nice. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? Like those, it's not poems, it's just a bunch of words you put together, but okay. <laughs> so from her perspective, it was just not traditional poetry, you know, uh, but I'm okay with, I'm okay with, you know, just redefining it the way that feels, yeah. you know, right to me. Yeah. Well, the Jeff Foster's poems don't rhyme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I think rhyming poetry is kind of a, I won't say outdated, but it's kind of an old style, you know, that uh, of course people can use, but um, so I mean, it's just not necessary to the form. It's just one way to go about it, right? Yeah. Have you have you read um, Rumi? Rumi, uh, yes, and that's one of the two poetry books I just bought when I was in Sedona. I bought one poetry book from. Uh, it's the second person. Uh, it's the first book I believe published by Sacred Dragon Publishing, who helped me to write my book, although I didn't. I published independently, uh, so I want to support them and check it out. And it's a really lovely book can't remember the name of it. Uh, and then um, I bought The Gift, which is a collection of poetry by Rumi. It's a thick book. Most poetry books are thin, like you said. Uh, I want to make a thick one because I think I have it in me, but the, the Gift is thick. It's a book by Rumi, and this guy is wild. I don't know how many poems you read by him, but he is he is off the hook. He's, he's not joking around. He, he, yeah, and um, well, but he is I, joking around actually, <laughs> in a way, right? I I know someone who I went to school with, and she's um, Persian, well Iranian, so she was able to. Uh, she's a writer and a therapist, and she did some translations for like rare Rumi poems, and I hadn't known about Rumi before I spoke to her. And um, Rumi's poems are like a rage for everyone. Like everyone just loves his, his work. And I hadn't known that, but he captures a, a good deal of what I think uh, your, you know, our point was for speaking tonight about sadness. Uh, there's one poem that I thought would be really appropriate for that. Oh yeah. And I, and I think he's just, yeah, like, like, also very clear. Like, I don't, I don't see any confusion. I don't, you know, I don't mm -hmm. read any confusion in his writing. Mm -hmm. but I'm reading translations, obviously. So. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I apologize. Um, I, I have read Rumi, but I did not buy a Rumi book. That's not who I was thinking of. Uh, is Rumi uh, uh, Muslim? He may have been. I'm not sure, yeah, but it's not sure. I, he's several hundred years old, maybe a thousand. Um, yeah, I'm familiar. Very, very spiritual, pretty powerful. I do know Rumi, but I can't really 
think of any of the specific work, but the book I bought was Hafiz. I heard Hafiz. It. Yeah. Yeah. He's a mystic. Iranian too. Yeah. So that's why I was kind of a little confused. Yeah. From that, that era, I think he's, yeah, Iran, Iraq, something like that. He, uh, Persian, he was definitely, um, uh, is Muslim, but, but he didn't really, just because he was, you know, he, he was much more, he was limited to one religion type of framework, you know, he wrote wildly. And, you know, of course, we're dealing with the translation and stuff, and the, the translator will have to consider how to make it appeal to a modern reader, but it feels very modern, and, like, he'll be, like, like picture, like, a whirling dervish, or, like, kind of losing his mind, and he talks about himself in third person, uh, which is fun, and uh, talks about, like, peeing wildly, or, like, uh, like bodily functions. It, it, it's really kind of gross and very light. It's like, the joy of life is so great that it, it drives him crazy. That's kind of the feeling when you read Hafiz. Mm. <laughs> like, because he's, he, like, he's in love like he, like he wants to make love to the universe almost type of feeling. He's in love with everything because he's so filled with the passion of God. But sometimes you read Hafiz, like a poem about love, and it feels like, wow, he just nailed that so perfectly. Uh, yeah, I, I wish I remembered that particular poem, but um, anyway, so Hafiz is another one. Yeah, I'm going to try to find the poem on Rumi that I thought of. Um since we are on the subject. Hafiz I heard about, I think I think Gabor Mate actually mentioned him once too, but um, Rumi House Guest poem. Um, okay, I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna read the whole thing. He says, this, this being human is a guest house. Oh, I'm sorry. That's good. Hello, and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer, and I'm Fiona. <laughs> um, hello? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> that wasn't what I expected. <laughs> it's all right. He, he was saying this, this, human, this being human is a guest house, that all emotions are, are welcome, you know. Um, and... Um, that's the gist of it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm willing to hear it if, if you want to read it. Okay, yeah, I'm going to find it on another um, thing because I don't want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond yeah that's pretty cool that's roomy uh yeah I, that's definitely uh connects rubs up against buddhism for sure this concept of uh treat treat everyone equally and i mean it sounds so mundane but uh but actually to to have that practice, not only treating everyone equally, but each obstacle uh, or blessing equally. You know, like you won the lottery, your house got destroyed to meet both with that same sense of gratitude, right? It's super difficult, but it's really, it's just the wind blowing one way, the wind blowing the other way, you know? So to be, to have equanimity, you know, amidst all of it. Yeah. 
yeah, that's one of the, I guess, uh, yeah, the disciplines of Buddhism, right? Equanimity, patience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And it's also, it's, it's really like more love for your, for, for everything that you're feeling. Cause it's like, there's a kind of hopefulness in it and even being able to, t- to be with her, mm-hmm. which, you know, it's not like, it's not like, uh, oh, it's beyond me. It'll, it'll, no, it's, it's just through me and it's one of my guests. And it's, mm-hmm. I like that way of looking at it. Yeah. It, like you said, yeah. Hopeful, um, uh, even sort of beyond hope in the sense that um, uh, I'm not saying this is a Buddhist principle or or not, but um, my point of view is this kind of idea to go beyond hope in the sense that hope has, uh, this isn't a criticism or anything, to what I'm just trying to struggle with. And I find it value in it, is seeing hope as tied to the future in a way. So, uh, mm-hmm. so to go beyond hope and like say I don't I don't even need hope, you know, because this guest is coming. Like I was sad the other day and didn't want to be sad, but but I was, and uh, just I, I would say trust, you know, n- not to discount hope or something, but trust was the main feeling I was holding on to, which is this is, uh, I trust this is part of the process, you know, and that, and it did, you know, just like a great cloudy sky. And the next day I felt fine. I didn't have to do anything. I think by not doing anything, that was the best thing to do. I would be by be natural, you know, just be myself. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah. I have, a. Hafiz poem, the one I was thinking of. Can I share that quick? I have. I had no idea we were going to do this, but this is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this one I recently heard on a class, an online class course I took with um, uh, Robert Holden. Do you know Robert Holden? He wrote a book called Shift Happens. He's, he's this really great sort of spiritual, yeah, spiritual doctor, teacher, and uh, Caroline Mice, I don't know if you heard of her, Caroline Miss, M-Y-S-S. They're great spiritual teachers. Uh, I find, I, I took a course and it was about love, love in the Enneagram. I don't know if you know what the Enneagram is, but. Uh, I, I've, I've been read. I've been, in, there's uh, someone named, um, what's his name? Almas, A-H Almas. He, he, wrote, he wrote about the, I thought it was pronounced Enneagram, right? Enneagram. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but yeah, I've heard some different people writing about that facets, mm-hmm. facets of humanity, facets of your being kind of thing. Yeah, like an ancient way to understand kind of, kind of like poetry is an ancient way to understand the universe with this very simple diagram, a uh, simple mandala that has a specific shape. It's a pretty curious shape. Uh, I can't speak too detailed on it. I, I studied it, but I don't I can't be a particular teacher yet. But anyway, I, it was about love and all the facets of love. And we, we, we all have all the facets, but each of us will have a dominant personality type in this particular, you know, human form that we take. Of course, our soul is much greater than this human form, but so we, we all are capable of all the personality types, but we all tend to have, you know, dominate a certain personality type dominates within us and by learning the aspects of the enneagram we can understand ourselves deeper and it was pretty pretty interesting for me to do that so anyway this is a poem by hafiz that was read by robert holden and uh so i'll share it i I might read it twice because it's pretty cool even after all this time The sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. So this is a love poem. So I'll read one more time. Even after all this time, 
The sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. So that's Hafiz in his uh, more serious tone, you know. That's, that, that's um, what some would call a koan or zen koan. I don't know how to pronounce zen it. Zen koan? Sort of. It has elements of it, yeah. It's not really, it's not really asking a question, but. Okay. I just see it because of the brevity that it would be of that, mm -hmm. yeah, sort, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's some cool. Um, my father-in-law put out a put out a book actually, uh, which he gave to his friends, you know, just because he wanted to do it. Of um, uh, haiku, mm -hmm. uh, haiku book, all jet, you know, in in Japanese, of course. And but he taught me a lot about it when I was there and ex explained how, what what an art form it is. And it is pretty cool. Uh, the English equivalent is a, quite a bit diluted because of the nature of English language versus Japanese. Like you could really pack a punch with those, what, what was it, 575? You know, with that 575 thing in Japanese, you could pack wallop. In English, you could, but it's, it, you know, you can't look at a character and get all this like layers of meaning in English. You know, you just see a word. Yeah. It, it's a little bit different, but uh, yeah. You know that, that inspired me that that he was putting out his book just to do it you know um yeah 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 when you think of like meters and like that haiku thing or whatever it is like the number of syllables and everything it's like a shape you know it's like these poems mm -hmm. they actually have like you know like i picture a haiku is a certain shape you know like a certain kind of Mm -hmm. it's a pentagram i don't know but <laughs> you know there's a with so yeah these these elements of poetry are really kind of interesting when you think about them yeah and what i what i liked about it it's, it's also kind of the way i approach a lot of things is i love limitations actually with art with creativity without limitations i don't feel like i don't get things done but if you say you can't do this you can't do that those are not options just work with this then I said, oh, okay. Um, like when I'm doing carpentry nowadays, I have what I have. Uh, if I need a specific one or two things for a project that's important, I might get it. I used to carry around this like <clears throat> uh, drawing pad, like 2006, 7, 8, around that time. Uh, a drawing pad of, you know, blank paper, nice, decent quality. And then a a box of 10 markers or a box of 16 crayons, wherever I went. And I would just draw what I saw with only those colors. And then when I would finish it before I was, you know, before I left the place, or maybe I'd make a little finishing touch later, but finish it that day, put a date on it. And that was it. And when I look back on it, it was kind of, it was better than a photograph. It was just like this, because I, because you're putting your energy and, and thoughts that go with you as you're moving your hand and you, the whole experience comes back. So I like, um, <clears throat> like you're saying with uh, haiku as a form, you know, you, you can only use that five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, you can't break it. Otherwise it's not a haiku, <laughs> you know, they're, they're pretty strict about it. You can't, you definitely can't break that. So um, what can you do with that? If you have this line you wanna put in, but it's six syllables, sorry, think of another line, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Right. And then it becomes something different. Right, right. It's like music. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Speaking of music, um, uh, I don't want to, not, not what are you listening to, Elio, that's all fair, but like we were saying yesterday, uh, let me throw you this question. Um, what would you suggest? Before you do that, mm -hmm. I, I, want, I want to hear what about that poem? What is it about that poem that that you like so much? Mm -hmm. Right, like I read it twice, right? Yeah. <sighs> okay, well, the class was about love and understanding love on the deepest level, like kind of tearing down any assumptions, all the the shallow aspects of love, just cutting right through it and, and just seeing like 
love is is actually everything. There is nothing but love. Uh, there's love or and the denial of love. That's all. But love is all there is, just like sunshine fills up the sky. And uh, so, like, as just as a way to live, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. He's not saying what you should do or shouldn't do, but he's just making a very, even after all this time, because he lays it out like that, you think, all right, it's been a long time, kind of like a forever type of thing. The sun never expects anything from the earth. And when you have love like that, the whole sky lights up. So if I could live that way, that where I never ever say to anyone, you owe me, or never even have the thought that anyone owes me anything, but just give, not like uh, recklessly <laughs> without taking care of myself, but give uh, as I can freely, nonstop, like the sun rejuvenating myself, just giving, 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 I could light up the whole sky maybe, you know, but that's like what that offers to me or anybody, could, we all could do that, right. you know. Which goes back to what we were talking about with bodhicitta or what, I don't know the pronunciation. <laughs> the, <laughs> there's, there's two words, I don't know if you're, which one you want, bodhisattva, which is a, a person that basically dedicates their lives to the well-being of others. And there's bodhicitta, I think which... Applying, okay, applying bodhicitta, it's, it's, this is from the book, The Courage okay. to Be Free. Mm. Um, so applying bodhicitta is the desire, the thought, the inspiration to benefit beings, and there are practices associated with that. Uh, applying bodhicitta, by contrast, is associated with actually beginning the work of helping others. Um, okay, wait, but she, she goes into it earlier. What is bodhicitta? Um, often translated as awakened heart or awakened mind. Absolute bodhicitta allows us to perceive the nature of ourselves and all phenomena as empty. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of, I think the well-being of others is the big, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the most uh, clear definition. And then there's, I guess it's, there's a hub and a, a lot of spokes to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. From what I'm reading. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. As I was, uh, as I understand it, you're studying perhaps uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, it's a form, I think, I believe that's a, uh, it's a Mahayana form of Buddhism. Uh, yeah. Different from the SGI Nichiren Buddhism. Uh, but of course, some of the principles are quite the same, you know, uh, like you're saying the four sufferings. I know, did you, are you saying the four noble truths, right? Four noble truths. <clears throat> yeah. Studying is a big jump. I'm reading. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and I have a, an appreciation, obviously. It's very, very interesting. Great. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Reading. Right, right. Yeah. Studying. <laughs> um so so the four sufferings just uh to, to to share a little bit um four sufferings of buddhism are birth uh sickness aging and death these are called the four universal sufferings birth sickness aging and death so the three sickness aging and death make sense uh birth may not sound like it makes sense for suffering but Essentially, that means life. Life itself, living, is is a form is suffering. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the need to eat and, and to find shelter and this like, you know, always, uh, yeah, being in this in this uh, th the mud and and muck of uh, of the Maya, the illus the illusionary world, is a form of suffering. Especially contending with our own desires, and being met or not met addictive addictions and, and whatnot um sorry what was that Dukkha, that's like Dukkha. A, yeah i think that's like the that we're always dissatisfied like our nature can never be satisfied mm -hmm. and that's part of suffering yeah right right yeah this uh 
there's this image um, in, so another concept in Nichiren Buddhism is uh, the 10 worlds. Uh, it starts from hell, uh, hunger, animality, humanity. Um, then I'm a little rusty, then level six is actually heaven. And then there's learning, realization, level nine is bodhisattva and level 10 is Buddhahood. So heaven is level six <laughs> in Buddhism. <laughs> That's pretty cool, right? Uh, <clears throat> so in the level of, um, yeah, hell, hunger, animality, I, I, I think anger is one of them. I didn't place it right. But in uh, hell and hunger, there's this concept of the, the hungry ghost, which I think, yeah, you may know the concept. I don't know if it's the same concept, but. It's one of Gabor Mate's most famous books in the, in the realm of hungry ghosts. Right, right. It's about addiction and that. Yeah, so I don't know if he defines it the same way as in Buddhism, but uh, it sounded like it was similar when we discussed it. But in the Buddhist concept is like, as far as I remember, that uh, you just um, eat and you just can't, it's like an empty hole. You That desire to eat is there, but it doesn't go in like, and you, you give you nutrition, it just like goes into like this empty vacuum. So you're always seeking pleasure, but you're never actually satisfied with anything with, you know, like a typical drug addict scenario. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And addiction being so more than just drugs. Yeah. So many layers of what it could be. So many different forms of it, you know, especially, yeah. Yeah. Addiction is addiction. Uh, what Jeff Foster says, addiction is distraction. It's just, Mm -hmm. out of our pain you know yeah 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 that, that's a very simple way to put it um so you mind if we jump to music or any, any more on poetry or, or buddhism uh, yeah that's good i i just wanted to hear it i think i think it's an interesting thing to talk about so cool yeah actually i'll, I'll just briefly mention what i've been reading i don't have all the books handy like, uh, um, uh, would have been a good idea. Anyway, so here's one book. So I'm, I'm been committed to, you know, li live a pain free life. <laughs> and I have the chronic pain of my back and, and my knee and my back is actually better. So, um, I really believe I have mind body syndrome, otherwise known as TMS. And I'm hoping that my knee is going to, uh, <laughs> also shift. Um, but anyway, this is this concept of unlearning pain that it's, it's so fascinating. I, I don't want to get too deep into it. Uh, there's another book called um, uh, The Great Pain Deception, The Great Pain Deception by Steve Ozanich, which is totally blown my mind. It's right at the same uh, concepts as Dr. Sarno. It's, it's like building on Dr. Sarno's work who wrote Mind Over Back Pain. And all, uh, yeah. I remember the names of his books, but he, the he really, mind. Right. yeah, The Divided Mind. Yeah, he really wrote wonderful books about how uh, chronic pain, it was started with back pain, but chronic pain really is, is something that uh, comes from our mind. And essentially it's like uh, the mind is trying to distract you from thinking about deeper issues that it thinks you can't handle. So the mind is thinks it's doing you a favor by giving you pain. So you don't go into this realm that the mind believes you, you can't handle. So it's like fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. And it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I Gabor Mate with, I, you know, all about the mind body, emotional issues and, and, and physical disease and absolutely in, in that um, vein. There's another book, there's a book that the mind body code. I don't know if you heard of that one. I haven't, I don't remember hearing of it, but mm -hmm. yeah, but all, all of them are basically like about like um, holism, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Power of belief, right? Power of thought. 
Oh yeah. And yeah. For sure. And beyond the power of positive, not just positive thinking, it's it's more correct thinking or or removing erroneous thinking patterns, you know, that are not yeah. Helping. And and how much of that is emotional um you know armor. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think that's probably also part of what pain is about. There's emotional armor. We're stiffening mm -hmm. parts of our body because of emotional blocks. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, one point this Steve Ozanich makes, which is controversial, I don't want to argue about it with anyone, but it's that um, if you can totally relax, uh, you won't be in pain, essentially. That, that Or like this idea of stiff bed or soft bed. You could sleep on anything if you totally relax your body. <laughs> but if we are chronic pain people, we hold tension, we're totally unaware of it. We're holding tension in places and also believing that what we someone told us that we shouldn't sleep in a soft bed. So if we're in a soft bed, we believe that we're going to have pain. And then we're holding tension through the night. So it's this compounding thing. But if we could say, you know what, whatever, I don't care what people say, I know I'm going to get a good rest and I'm going to completely relax. We can wake up feeling fine. You know, it's, it's this, it's amazing. Thing. I saw this video of a monk, a uh, Buddhist monk. I don't remember what type of Buddhism who was doing training and he did a video and uh, they just have this really thin mat, but kind of like, almost like a, like, just a piece of cloth, you know, that's they, they're, they're robe. They have like a second robe and they, they roll it up. That's their bed. They sleep outside in the forest or something as part of this training. And they, they just roll this little thing for a pillow or, or use a rock. I don't even know. And they get up early and they're bright and smiling. And I'm sure they have some degree of aches and pains that humans have, but it's, it's not, they're not complaining about it. You know, somehow they, they're, like happy despite of it, or maybe they're not in pain. I, yeah, I don't know. But like seeing these trainings and part, yeah, part of it's on a uh, non-attachment, right? This ability to actually not not be not only not be attached to things and material possessions, but not be attached to your pain. It's just not. Yeah, and how much of that? Like, look at the lengths that people have to go to. They can't be. They can't be in our in our society. They have to. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I, mean, I think that says a lot. You know. <laughs> I think it does say a lot, right there. Um, so yeah. So switching gear. Oh, um, it's one of the book I want to mention. Uh, it's called. Uh, making asterisk you don't say the asterisk it's there making asterisk contact but that's part of the title that asterisk it's called making contact and the asterisk in the middle is like this it's pretty cool because it, it's a really fascinating book i think it's nine or ten essays uh, articles that were contributed by nine or ten different people that uh does the author want to write something about making contact and how it's you know inevitable that soon uh, humans will be communicating with other interplanetary beings and many already have, but it'll be, it's going to become mainstream. And then uh, he said, you know what, to be more effective, making contact, he, I actually, you know, uh, I've watched, listened to his interviews. Also, I was at the Sedona event with a lot of people on this topic. Um, He's, he explained that making contact isn't a, a, an, an event that happens. Like if you picture the, uh, the close encounters of the third kind, like the, the people are communicating with beings with, through music, it could happen in, in any sort, many sorts of ways. That could be one of them, but it's not this one event is which we might get in our head that it's like Independence Day. You know, they land on the White House lawn and like, oh, contact. Now they're here. It's 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 much more. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous <laughs> it's, it's much more of a mosaic you know like there's because there's many potentially many different uh races of of interplanetary beings and uh you know you know 
you want to call them aliens, that, that's kind of a loaded word, I guess. But um, are you including other dimensional beings, like even beings like energy beings who live on Pluto. So you think you can't live on Pluto, but if you're an energy being of light, you can live on Pluto. You know that, So there's like whole different things that we can't conceive of. Um, but you get it from like, first it starts talking from government, people who work in the government for like defense, uh, defense teams or whatever that were there to try to study UFOs for defense and also to try to get their technology. So that, that's what the government do because that government's a very, very primitive. Government is a very primitive way of thinking, right? So governments, you know, they need to protect the country and they need to like get a one up. That, that's kind of what they think. So it's something bad, but they, so this guy like explains why governments do what they do. It's not this, uh, this like blanket conspiracy theory they want to hide. There's good reason for what they do or, or their perspective. And then, um, and also because they're afraid and actually don't know what to tell people, you know? So then there's uh, experiencers, people have been abducted and people who channel, like Bashar actually wrote an article. I feel uh, familiar with Daryl Anka Bashar. Yeah, yeah, I remember. So, so the, the asterisk, basically, uh, asterisk, um, Aster actually means star in, in Greek. So uh, I think asterisk itself means something like um, fallen star, something like that. And then asteroid means, well, asteroid, I guess, would be fallen star. So this aster has the meaning of star and it actually looks like a star. And the point of it is that it has this multi layers of what an aster can mean. And that's the whole making contact, UFO, uh, UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena. Um, that's the whole like thing we have to swallow that it's, it's a uh, mosaic. And it's also, um, it's like the asterisk. It, or like, you know, the music in Close Accounts of the Third Kind. It's not like clear message necessarily. Sometimes it might be. Sometimes it might just be more like, this presence that we become aware of that there's things far greater than we can imagine. And that's the contact. And that, that just elevates our consciousness, our awareness. It's not that we learn specific technology. We could, that might be part of it, but it's not necessarily, you know? There's so many different ways to approach it. And that's why this book is great. It, it comes from a lot of different point of views. The skepticism is included. It's not, you know, just blind. It's a lot of questioning. A lot about oneness that the being these other beings are us essentially because you know everything in the universe is one it, it's pretty fascinating stuff hmm. Hmm. how does someone get their potential to write something like that though uh forget what he is um his name is uh, uh alan steinfeld pretty fun guy to listen to uh I'm, he, I love Seinfeld. And, <laughs> and your name is Alan, so you can remember his name. <laughs> yeah. Alan Steinfeld. Uh, he, uh, he, he had his own, um, he had his own experience in, I think it's 1987. So that put him on the path. And then since then, kind of, kind of like David Icke, you know, he's like, just took a path and he, he created his own, you know, deep investigation because he couldn't not do it. You know, especially he, his, he's not like David Icke in like the same material or anything, but just he had an event to change his life and he just went with it, you know, something like that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you do, you go to UFO uh, conferences, you, you go to, you speak out, you start a podcast and you keep on talking about it. And then all the people in, who are in the field, like, like Bashar, Linda Moulton Howe, she's someone who's out there doing investigations for, 40, 50 years, you know, you end up talking to the same crowd and you get to know each other. And then, so, and then he invited people to contribute to this book or something like that. Okay. Interesting. That's a, I haven't gone into the alien stuff before, but I know a lot of people who do. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, my, 
my information is, what do I know? I don't know. Well, what do you think is the draw for you about the, the extraterrestrial, um, you know, discovery? Um, when I'm reading that book, I just feel happy. And there are, there are elements of fear because of the unknown. Actually, every night, <laughs> every night I go to bed, probably this whole year, I've been a little bit afraid. Look, I always look out the window thinking I'm going to see a ship. Seriously, every night. Because I, I, I'm afraid I'm ready, you know, to make contact. That's kind of how I feel. And then when I think, when I picture like a being, beings walking into the room and taking me or something, I, I get scared. But um, uh, since I was a kid, I used, I used to have these ear tags that grew out of, you know, this kind of like weird thing that grew out of my ear that we got lasered off when I was in third grade or something. And I used to tell my cousin that those are my antennas to talk to my, talk to my home planet. From, I, I don't know where I got, no one told me that. I mean, maybe I watched the Jetsons and I got the idea, I don't know, but, uh, but I used to say that. And then um, my son Kai has been talking about what planet he's from for years already. He always said, one of the first questions he asked people is what planet are you from? And he means it. Like you could think he's joking and whether you take it as a joke or not doesn't matter, but he asks you and he expects an answer, you know? And uh, even before he came around, I remember I started telling my students that I was from planet Xenon with an X, X-E-N-O-N. -N. And I wrote a song, I started to write a song called Xenon. I wrote a bunch of space type related songs. I started to explain what Xenon was, that they have, instead of guns, they have nugs. And a nug is something like, let's say you're mad, I'm mad at you. I aim my nug at you and I shoot. And then a bunch of, then it's like, it's like this hoop that comes back to me, a bunch of flowers and like pretty sparkly things and nice fragrance comes at me. And I associate that, those positive feelings with you because I'm looking in your direction. Then I feel much better and I, and I can uh, love you. So, and the same, and then Nanex, instead of cannons, we have Nanex, which is the same thing, but towards a, another country, you like shoot this nanak if you made it. Another country, you shoot it and then there's like waves of flowers and nice smelling perfumes come back at you from that country and you associate positive things. So that's how weapons work on planet Xenon. It's not weapons would not be the proper word for it. Um, so all this to say that this, I've been half playing with the idea that I'm an alien, but I always say it's, I'm only half kidding. And I don't know why I say that, except that that's what the, that just feels like the truth to me. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I had, I had a uh, experience. I think I told you when I was like learning to see auras uh, around when it, 2007 and I looked in the mirror and I like had I saw all these different beings inhabiting my body. Did I tell you about that at some point? I, I don't remember. You may have. So yeah, I, anyway, I had this experience seeing like that I'm comprised of all these mul multiple, not really personalities, multiple entities that are, that are in, comprise who I am and that they're all part of me. And uh, there was this like, um, this like, big headed alien with like big eyes, kind of like a watcher, a scientific. And there was this uh, kind of like brutish Quasimodo, really strong one who was like a slave. I got the feeling, but super strong. Then another like kingly looking one, uh, kind of human. And then um, one with just eyes, no mouth. My mouth disappeared as I'm looking at the mirror and there's daylight. Uh, and then the, just went totally black. And I saw nothing, um, which was scary. And it went to remind me that I'm John Henry Sheridan is going to just, before long, going to totally disappear and be nothing. So really make the most of this life. And this happened in 2007. And uh, actually, there was a time I wasn't talking to one of my friends. And I reached out to him to say, hey, hope everything's all right by you. Because I didn't want, you know, it was just kind of this 
get over yourself type of experience I had. Anyway, so I had these experiences, you know, and uh, yeah, I have no reason to, to think that they're not real, but equally, I can't prove anything, you know? So. It's spiritual sounding. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, big, big self. Uh, you know, yeah. Ego kind of understanding, you know, take away your name, take away your nationality, take away all of these things that ego, you of self, it's like, they're not real per se, you know, they're just, I mean, they're real in, but they're not you, you know, like that's not, anyway, I'm using. Yeah. Yeah. No, you just, you go, you go with it. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, uh, I want to honor your time and not keep us too long. Uh, let's, uh, let's get into, we can kind of put emotions and music together. Uh, so there's some, okay. We, we had the theme of, you know, sadness when we talked yesterday, I brought that up and, you know, I was sad the other day. What do you think sadness is or that we just could go on a deep dive, but just, I don't know, just off the top of your head. What is sadness to you? I think it's hurt. That's what I see. There's like a, it's a wound. And there's, and there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a, a, a hunger for love. Something like that. I think that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there. What about this uh, concept? Um, this is just just another question, not necessarily related, but related, but um, not directly. Uh, do you believe um, that I certainly do that um, some of us, especially em empathic people, people who are extra sensitive? Uh, can pick up on the sadness in the collective and not just not to say that we don't have our own sadness but uh that it could be amplified by just like the collective energies uh yes i believe that it's like a psychological term that i learned called interpersonal neurobiology Mm -hmm. and how our biology and neural like um we like our whether we're in a fight or flight or safety mode or whether we're in a you know gut gutturally like from our gut from our body is you know based on the environment we're in you know I see you angry and something happens to me. I see you, you know, relaxed and um, affirming and that brings that out in me. So that's totally like the way I see it. It's like we're, we're um, kind of affecting our, our neurobiology or we're affecting our, neuro, our our biological states. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. And, and and there are people that are very sensitive to that, more sensitive to, than others. Um, I think everyone has that capacity, but we've learned to shut them off. So, yeah, um, yeah. I feel totally. That makes sense. Uh, Neuro, was it, uh, interconnected neurobiology or interpersonal neurobiology mm -hmm. yeah it makes a lot of sense to me you know i do think like this all this empty space between us is it's not empty and uh this idea that i'm separate from you or anyone else around me or even the things around me is just this kind of strange 
not a glitch, but a strange perception that's tied to this experience I'm choosing to have. I don't know how else to say it, you know? Um, yeah, I feel that some of us are kind of designed to, uh, to be almost like, you know, the sponge in the ocean, like absorbs like toxic things and then uh, actually um, processes them and makes the water clean. I think some of us do that. And I think I'm one of them that I, I take in energies of the collective, not because I want to, but it's just kind of my nature. And I can, for the most part, process it and create a cleaner energy that, that comes out of me than what I take in. So I think that's part of why I was sad. And part of it is just, you know, feeling sadness from things in my life that, uh, you know, it's time to feel sad, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Um, so music, music, uh, unless you want to say something more about that. No, no. Uh, Dan Siegel, he's the one who, who coined that term. Mm -hmm. personal. And then, and then there's one other thing I, I learned about. There's, have you heard of the vagus nerve? Yes. Mm -hmm. At, okay. There's Alan. Alan says hi. Because it's on headphones, he can't hear you, but. Uh, oh, he can't hear me. Okay. Right. Hello. Alan says hi. <laughs> He's waiting for you to come hang out with us. I'd love to. Yeah, come play uh, Super Mario with, with us. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, hang out in the backyard, whatever. Um, yeah, the vagus nerve, I've been looking into that. It seems connected to, uh, it's the to pain, you know. Nerve in our body or something like mm -hmm. that. And then there's this, there's these parts, the dorsal and the ventral. And when you're in dorsal vagal, you're in a fear response and you feel disconnected and you feel, you know, flight fight, freeze, and then ventral being front, ventral, vagal, it's it, our neurobiology is connected, feeling, um, you know, more social, social. Um, okay. Yeah. More in a social engagement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Then learn a bit about, yeah, it, it's great how, you know, how learning about biology and psychology and science to a certain degree, certain types of looking into science a certain way, certainly uh, quantum physics and stuff like that. And um, uh, just trying to be healthy too, how, how this all kind of interrelates and creates this like nexus of higher consciousness that we all can tap into from so many different angles. Yeah, yeah. For sure, interdisciplinary interconnection mm -hmm. beyond religion, but yet respecting you know respect the religions, but also kind of some meeting meeting beyond it in a way, you know. Yeah, yeah, meaning beyond it, comparative religion perhaps, or mm -hmm. uh, amalgamation and, yeah. and additions, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I'm going to bring the question forward that let us lighten the mood, not that it's not light, but let's maybe even, <laughs> let's, let's even laugh, maybe. Um, what? Uh, <laughs> guys laughing. So um, what is a band that or artists that you listen to now that you didn't listen to when you were younger and maybe you're surprised by? So this was, I think, your question, but yeah, throwing it at you. Yeah, I'm going to say... I'm gonna say a genre. I'm just uh, I'm liking soul music a lot more these days. Mm -hmm. um, I like you know I I always knew James Brown was great, but you know uh, Otis Redding, James Brown, um, just old blues people. Um, I listen to this channel on Sirius XM, Tom Petty's Buried Treasures, and I just mm -hmm. got into these all these different like mid sixties kind of music and blues and, and, you know, a lot of it from black Americans who created all this incredible music. Yeah. Just like in the soul stuff a lot and peoples and all of these just like really cool 
acts of music that um, are like really there. The the word soul is very uh, appropriate. There's a mm -hmm. real there's a real feeling, you know, like because I've been you know I've been I've been wronged, I've been hurt, you know, or I need you really bad. All those kinds of like themes that are really they're just heartfelt. They're a little bit more uh, raw. Yeah, right. And basic, right? Really basic human emotions, basically. Yeah, yeah. Really right. good stuff. So, yeah, that's what I've been listening to more. Like, in... Wow, cool. Hmm. <clears throat> and I want to start listening to gospel because I think, I think it's a beautiful, like, how can music become something where you believe in God? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's an interesting thing. Like, d d d this is the God chord progression. You know, this is the God. Mm -hmm. It's pretty beautiful. Oh, yeah. I, 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 uh, there is an artist I would definitely recommend that I have to let her name come to me, but blew, blew me right out of that water. I came out of a, um, a dentist in Canarsie. And I went to this uh, like 99, it's not 99 cent shop, but it's kind of like a discount store across the street. And uh, it was Avenue L or whatever. And I went in, and I heard this music and the people were smiling at me. How often does that happen? You go to a 99 cent store and the clerk's smiling and nice to you. I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, and there's a blasting piping you know, piping some good ass gospel music right through the speakers. <laughs> every corner, every nook and cranny of the store was filled with filled with the spirit. I was yeah. like, wow. And I'm like, is this is gospel, right? I when I was checking out, I'm like, what's the name of this artist? And it gave me the name. Then I went and put it on Spotify on the way home. And I was like, holy crap. Like more more powerful, equally as powerful as Iron Maiden, Metallic, anything like that. It's just like soul shaking. Yeah, yeah. You know, I got to give this artist name, but uh, awesome. Yeah. Um. So, so uh, one of the style that I've been is it a style? Well, I'll just say some bands that I've been getting into that I never liked before, because part of it's doing this. I always look for new music, um, or at least different music because it's so boring to listen to the same stuff over and over again. Um, but and as, as I'm writing my autobiography, what I'm doing is I'm trying to go year by year to figure out what music came out when. And uh, so I really had no idea what came out in two, excuse me, 2004, five, six, seven, eight, not, no idea, right? I couldn't tell you anyway. So some of the, uh, be careful, it's a battery. So, um, dashboard confessional. I, I don't think, uh, yeah. I don't, Death Cab for Cutie. Death Cab for Cutie is a solid band. Yeah, they're 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 okay. Yeah. Uh, the Strokes. Eh. Yeah. Sometimes the Killers have have a couple of good songs. Decent. They're better than the Strokes. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 there's this one song. Um, do you want to some? I, I was listening to it with my with Kai. Um, I think I think it's Dashboard Confessional. Oh, no, no, Franz Ferdinand. That's the one. Franz Ferdinand. They have this really kind of powerful, dancey rhythm song. I can't say they're a good band. I don't know, but a few songs that really kind of I looked forward to listening to. You know, once in a while. It's not that song, Take Me Home. Da, 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 da. Um, no, but that, that one's got a strong kick to it, too, right? Yeah. It, I've always heard that one. Yeah. Um, there's another song called uh, I you Write, I I write Sins. I Write Sins, Not Tragedies. Do you know who? who I think that might be Death Cab for Cutie. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, didn't there, haven't you ever heard to get a room or something like that? Uh, let me see. When I put in friends for an end, Spotify, it'll probably show the song I listen to. Do you want to? It's called. 
Yeah, do you want to? And then just take me out, like you said. Not great, not great, but I can listen to it. But musically, not bad. Just no, not definitely not bad. Yeah, yeah, I don't like, like it, yeah. yeah. So that's something. Any other music that you've uh, come across lately that maybe a little bit surprised uh, by, or just didn't like when you were younger? Um. I, I like the blues and I like uh, yeah I don't know oh uh, yeah Bob Dylan I'm 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 digging more of Bob Dylan mm -hmm. you know I think I'm getting him more. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some really good songs of his I think mm -hmm. yeah yeah he's a challenge for me to get uh, I I appreciate him as an artist and uh, as, a, as a lyricist, as a presence, as a personality, as like a cultural icon, and like a, a reference yeah. point, you know. But um, yeah, I, I read a, a few portions of his, one of his autobiographies. It's definitely wacky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, interesting. Yeah. A lot of it was, I was upstate when I read it and uh, he lived up he lived in one of the towns nearby when i was reading like really um it must have been tough life actually um nothing to be jealous about you know like wasn't you know just because he's like super popular doesn't mean he had a an easy life or anything yeah yeah i don't know if i'm listening to anything new i, th I think it's more the genres and yeah and I, I like I like my good like I'm pretty random anyway like I'll listen to something and be like I want to hear this like I want to hear some REM I want to hear some I don't know why. Dude. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, here's a question: uh, Can you think of a band that you've tried to like multiple times and just never worked? Or you keep on giving the benefit of the doubt, like yeah, let me try again. Maybe two, two or three bands like that there's like one thing that <laughs> you have a question you can say it uh, what is it there's a cake that i always try yeah oh, and, and that it tastes good <laughs> yeah no. i was telling stories from my uh my youth and uh i was saying when i in 1998 around in high school Era, I had a job working as a box boy where my mom works in that office. And uh, I would eat at Mauer's Deli. Do you remember Mauer's Deli in Quentin? <laughs> great, great chicken salad sandwich. Okay. Okay. So I, I would get like a, um, yeah, a cold cut sandwich or more likely uh, egg and cheese. Yeah, bacon, egg and cheese. Maybe ba just egg and cheese, maybe with ketchup on it. And then chips and then an Arizona iced tea or something. And I couldn't pass up the hostess corner. So like the, the sweet cakes, Drake's cakes, hostess, I had to get some from there every time. And like, you know, there's ring dings, there's uh, Twinkies, you know, you name it. Uh, Ding dongs, king dongs, uh, <laughs> devil dogs. I would, plastic, by the yeah, way. Oh yeah, really, they're very hard to eat. <laughs> so, and I would try these and remember the, like the apple pie was that hostess apple pie kind of really weird oh, type yeah, the, of the, the, the square food pies yeah those yeah, yeah. I, think they were, I forgot which brand i think they were host yeah, they I were good know. and they were disgusting all yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I, I told kai every time like a funny bones and then there was the snowballs remember snowballs snowballs look better than they taste exactly that's what kai said so i told kai i would try these candies like snowballs and be like this looks so cool and i would eat it and be like like waiting for the good part to start never started you know and uh like certain bands and i'm like but i would be fooled in every time like that looks really good i want to try that and never was good but it was never bad enough that it would stop me from buying it again you know you so you ever eat little debbies sorry dude little debbies are gross too but anyway yeah no they're all they're terrible drake's cakes little debbies <laughs> some of them are worse than others hostess was kind of on the higher realm from the twinkies are are, are are a delight i still think but yeah so um anyway we, we unless you want to go on to into that 
uh, realm. Yep. <laughs> okay, so, tell, so tell me about your hostess. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was just the same thing. I would always get the lunch at Mauer's Deli or somewhere like it, and and I would always be tempted by this this uh, what do you call those sponge cakes or whatever they're called um that corner you know they had like the rack of all this stuff and you know I was a sweets addict and i would just try it and i don't know why i knew it was going to bring my energy way down it, it was the price too it was like it said 50 cents on you like well like they had the cookies like three or four cookies it was 25 cents like how can i how can i go wrong <laughs> very very easily yeah um can you remember doing that like buying uh, uh one of yeah. those type of cakes and like thinking it's going to be good and not not liking it but then doing it again um not so much of maybe a few times not really i'm pretty clear on what i like but little debbie's so I used to have the cupcake wheel. I don't know if you ever had the cupcake wheel. Like it was like a little Debbie cake and it was a white cake. And then it was like these black stripes on them and they tasted awful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was not good. But uh, my mother used to buy them and they were like, the whole box was like 50 cents. <laughs> what? <laughs> it sounded horrible. Yeah, they taste, they tasted awful, but I ate them. Because there were so many of them, and it was just like, oh, Little Debbie's. And now when I see a Little Debbie, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Funny Bones are pretty good. Is that Hostess? As Drake's, maybe? Funny Bones had peanut butter filling inside. Yeah, I didn't like the Funny Bones. <laughs> King Dons were pretty good, or Ding Dongs. I think they were, like, kind of the same one was bringing yeah, They were the same. Ring I, yeah, Ring Ding, yeah. I like those. Yeah, those are good. They're pretty good. Uh, the the hostess. Devil dogs with, with dirt. I, I, I can't describe the flavor. It was like, I, why were they that bad? Don't eat them if you don't have water nearby. <laughs> no, because you're not going to finish. <laughs> it's going to get stuck at the top of your mouth. And, uh... It gave me a headache when I ate it because to try to like, Get it down. Just you know? the name sounds horrible. Yeah, devil dog. <laughs> Doesn't sound good. He's, he's, he's right. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why they can't if it's called devil dog. Great question. It's, it's, it rhymes. No, it doesn't rhyme. It's alliteration. Yeah, alliteration, yeah. Um, Oh, what, what were some of your favorite candy bars? Because I, I told Kai some of my favorite candy bars, I'm sure. He'd be curious. Let's say real young, as young as you could think of, like uh, when you were eight, nine, ten. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Kit Kat was always good. Twix. Mm -hmm. He loves Twix. Definitely like Twix. Um, I also like the chips a lot. Mm -hmm. so, I also like Kit Kat, too, and Twix, both. I know. Onion garlic potato chips. Oh yeah, that was good. Onion garlic potato chips. Yeah. Yeah, make your hand. Yeah, onion garlic potato chips. Uh, some of the ones I like. Tell me if any of these ring a bell. Uh, bar none. Bar none was good. Is that still around? I don't think so. Well, it has such a weird name. Yeah, it's. Weird I have a feeling it's gonna taste good, but it's a very weird name. Yeah, it's a weird name. Yeah. What you gonna call it? Whatchamacallit was good. Yeah. Um, I like the name. Just the name. Really. <laughs> Chunky. Yeah. <Ugh. laughs> <laughs> now for you? I mean, it was, it's kind of gross. It was kind of, really? it was like this big, this big block of chocolate. <laughs> with nuts in it. And, just, and raisin. It was great. Yeah, right? You have to be a mental patient to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the name. I don't like the name. I, love I don't like the name Chunky. I just don't like that. Name. All right, all right. I understand. <laughs> Snickers. They're still Snickers around. Always a, yeah, that was totally not needing to eat that ever again. But right. right. 
it was ridiculous when they had the campaign recent relatively recently like you know cure your if you're hungry snickers right it's like the cure for hunger or something that's <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> not true so, that's terrible <laughs> yeah you know you shouldn't have a candy bar if you're hungry I mean, it, it shouldn't be something that they teach you you know it's like sometimes yes that you can do it but <laughs> skittles you a skittles guy it's good but it's it's not my thing but i but everyone liked it and had it and i'd eat it I, i'd like ask for it and eat it mm -hmm. All right and i'd eat it i'd buy it a few times but it's you know it's too candy it's too too fruity yeah too fruity i so my thing was French and onion dip and chips. That was like, that was my. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was your. That was yours. Your your good place. That was that was my like yeah like my. My jam. It was my mm -hmm. jam. Yeah. Did I ever tell you when I got home from school? In third, fourth, fifth, I don't know. In grade school, I would often uh, have a bowl of ice cream. And sit in front of the TV and watch, you know, nice big bowl of chocolate ice cream while watching cartoons. I have this. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the days. And I, in my, in my uh, Catholic school uniform, <laughs> brown and white. That's even worse. <laughs> and I, I would, I would often uh, microwave the ice cream. What? So it was. <laughs> <laughs> so it's chocolate ice cream soup. Yeah. <laughs> I I actually mix it. I actually mix it. And make it soup that way. Yeah, but I don't really like the the microwave way. It goes even soupier. Yeah. It goes so burning hot and soup. <laughs> I don't like that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't like me. I like it cold and then hotter. <laughs> so you like ice cream cold? That's weird. <laughs> um that runts remember runts what not not the best i'll tell you what's really like ridiculous the dots with the like with the receipt paper candy oh yeah oh no <laughs> somehow i just like them somehow i like, them. like them like a little bit not mm -hmm. really just a little bit <laughs> they don't make sense no. <laughs> no sense. And you're getting a lot of wax paper in your mouth for years consuming. Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh, Apple talking about Easter candies. Um, not sure if he knows too many, but did you like jelly beans? Of course. Who doesn't? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't love them, but see occasionally. Um, what about? Well, like I mean, I guess you never received a big. Easter bunny bar chocolate, but you wouldn't have been a fan. You don't like big chunks of chocolate. I I do like chocolate, but the chunky I don't know. The chunky was like <laughs> there was something about that. I don't know. Like it was bad for your teeth. Like it was very bad for your teeth. It, yeah, yeah. When you bit into it because of like the squaring nature of it or something, they're like a <laughs> large in like the upper quadrant. Of <laughs> <laughs> anatomically not yeah. compatible <laughs> yeah yeah it was like yeah i give you how i give you a boy bit it the wrong way that's funny all right what about gum were you a gum guy so remember when there was a gum there was a line of gum of soda gum do you remember that there was mm. a time where there was like root beer gum and coca-cola gum uh, well, I remember those flavored candies. But, uh, yeah. That's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of the, the weird thing. Yeah, and there was bubble tape. Remember the bubble tape? Bubble tape? Yeah, it was like six feet of gum. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A bubble. Yeah. Oh, man. That was crazy. What was that? It's good. Hey, can you imagine how they made that stuff? <clears throat> can you tell me your knock knock joke? Okay. It's really yeah. good. It's Let's so hear. good. Knock knock. Who's there? Are you really gonna say that? <laughs> That's a good one. Is that a good one? I liked it. I didn't expect it. <laughs> That's an original. It's an original. <laughs> <laughs> that one's so good. 
<laughs> oh, remember, uh, um, remember, uh, your friend Micah was looking for a uh, a countertop. I think I found one. I found a a countertop for Micah. Uh... <laughs> My horrible. Yucky. They're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> So horrible. Mm -hmm. That's so dumb. How do you make incredibly dumb one? Um, how do you make a what? Incredibly yeah. dumb joke. Yeah. He's asking me. Oh, you, you just say something that's dumb. <laughs> you know, I used to play uh, triangle in a uh, reggae band. Oh, man. yeah. Oh, 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 I used to so play good. triangle in a reggae band, man. But I had to quit. It was one thing after another. Man. <laughs> That was a good one, right? After all, that was a good one, right? That's a good one. <laughs> one thing after another. Why, why, why did you sound like you were Irish? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds Jamaican. I can't jump into my Jamaican accent without a little warm up first, you know. <laughs> you, you sounded like you know your name was uh, McGon oh, Halligan. Mahoney, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Um, so, okay, so one band that you, uh, tried to get into, but you just can't. I never tried to get into them, but I don't think I will ever like the Deftones. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, like, I've heard their music and I'm like, I don't know what this is. Like, like Joey seems to like them a lot and other people do. I don't like them. Mm -hmm. I never really understood. Do you like them? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I can like them for about 30 seconds. You know, I'm like, yeah, this is kind of cool. And then it goes on and on. Nothing get, doesn't get any better. I'm like, <clears throat> it sounds like something really bad is happening. <laughs> right, when you listen, like, it's a world I don't want to know about. Yeah, it sounds like, it just doesn't sound like it sounds like it landed. I just never, I never. Into got, horribleness? I never it's got not, the way. Yeah, it's not, it's not for us. You might it's like it. It wasn't there. No, no. But here's a band we, we, oh, okay, I'll give you one that I just. Oh, yeah. I'll say a band that I love now more. I like them a lot, and now I really like the system of a death. Hmm. Interesting. That, that, that's a band I've, I grew appreciation for. And even Kai likes them, if you can believe it. Uh, remember System of a Down there, they wrote that song X. That's kind of crazy. I hate that song. Yeah, but you kind of like it. Yeah, I kind of like it and I hate it. Yeah. Well, that's System of a Down. You kind of like it, but you hate it. Or or you kind of hate it, but you like it. Yeah, basically. I, I've been listening to BYOB from them what? recently. It, like As I'm putting on like rock of whatever year and hitting the hits, I would see them or listen to it and it's just it's a little bit add for sure that band oh yeah for sure more than a little maybe but what would but what they do is quite good like the you know the diverse sections are well done they're original yeah it's original it's it, it's pretty you know that the that byob riff like when it um I don't know if it's the chorus. Yeah, I think it's that part. The riff is crunchy. It's really crunchy. And then the crunchy? The beginning riff is like like really speedy. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're they're, they're a good band. They're yeah. They're like the they're the only new metal band I like. Yeah. A second runner up to them. And not that not that close but maybe the second runner up if you're talking about new metal would be disturbed yeah i would say they're a decent band they're a decent band. like i don't care to listen to them but i like that they're around yeah <laughs> right yeah me too <laughs> i like their like i like their punch mm -hmm. there's something unique about them yeah uh you ever get into corn? Hate corn. <laughs> Can't stand corn. I think they're the worst music. None of it sounds good. Not one song. 
<laughs> not, I, I didn't like it when it was first out when I was a kid, and I still don't like it. It's it scares just, me. It scares me that it exists in a way. I, I just don't, it's, it's just, it's really like, it's like an allergy. I don't like it. Well, it, Kai has a Martian band that stinks he wants to tell us about. It's so horrible. It's called, it's called Z and it's horrible. Every single song's called Z and it sounds the same. Plus it sounds so horrible. It's just the same beat over and over again. It's a nightmare. Oh, no. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> And it's, it is only one word. Oh no, don't even change the lyrics? <laughs> yeah. What's the word? It's called Z. Oh no. <laughs> Z, 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 Z. Yeah, 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 that's the way it's safe. It's oh. so horrible. <laughs> and I heard, when I heard it the first time, I think like, I hate this band. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like them either. <laughs> Nobody would like it. So here's one. Uh, I'm curious about this one. Corn or Limp Biscuit? I would say corn. Yeah, you kind of have to go with corn with that. Yeah. Limp Biscuit has almost no redeeming value at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, corn. I would, my go money. Just, I would go with corn for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. This I think we might diverge on Soundgarden or Audio Slave. Uh, Soundgarden. That's... For me, Audio Slave. Okay. Because because there's they're not more interesting. Soundgarden's more interesting, but Audio Slaves at least has some elements of positivity. Soundgarden doesn't. To my ears, doesn't. Almost but, nothing. Okay, but as far as music. What, what sounds more kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly Audio Slave is pop, right? To, to a great degree. Um, <clears throat> so I guess Soundgarden is kind of more interesting in, in terms of like, Daddy. what is, what's going on? You know, like you could learn more maybe as a musician. Let's talk about knock-knock jokes. Oh. Wait, can I tell you something, Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> you do a really good one that like it, like the the bad dad that one. Oh okay, okay yeah. Cool. I'll come back to that. Um <clears throat> yeah, Soundgarden, like it's just it just brings me down almost every single song. Uh <laughs> like a pretty noose. That's weird. Yeah, I like but that. it's but it's it's a downer. <laughs> it's a big downer. Uh Jesus Christ Superstar, that's cool for about 30 seconds. Then it's like, oh gosh, this is bringing my soul way down. Um, the, the my Wave, I have no good. idea what that is. Spoon Man is a, a tiny bit positive because it's not about anything that I could figure Jesus out. Christ Paul is not Jesus Christ Superstar. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> just the, it doesn't sound, just the, uh -huh. the name's cool, but it sounds horrible, right? Right. Slaves and Bulldozers, get me out of here. <laughs> I hate that name. Uh, <laughs> it's so dark, man. So dark. And like, it's unnecessarily so, I felt. But then he had some glimpses of positive lyrics in Audio Slave. He really did. I thought we were going to talk about candies <clears throat> again. Hi, I think it's time for you to go to bed, dude. It's 10 o'clock. Okay. Okay, I'll, tell, I'll say one joke to Alan before you go. Okay, so Alan. Um, what did the father, no, no, what did the, the young boy say to his father when uh, they went shopping in Iraq? What did the young Iraqi boy say to his father when they went shopping? Did he bring the bag, Dad? Yeah, <laughs> bag, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> That's Hi. good. Good night. I love you, Sam. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow. Let's talk about a pirate takeover. <laughs> bag. That wasn't bad. Yeah. Yeah, bring back that. <laughs> yeah. He's seven? Uh, in July. So, still six. Okay. Just 
just uh, a year younger than my nieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They grow up fast, as they say. We do too. We yeah. Grow, we, yeah. Time, time flies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of which, we're almost at the two hour mark. So I guess uh, let's respect. Yeah. We should hold on a second. I just want to find a book that I can quote it this time. Where is it? Uh, hold on. Everybody's going to the party. Have we a good time? So It's a good book. Uh, which one were you trying to find? Uh, the, the Book of Poetry, Jeff Foster. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll write his name down. I'll, I'll look for it. Look up his stuff on YouTube. He's, um, he's definitely um, about to sadness. <laughs> <laughs> But but has a an interesting kind of presence, you know. He you know it's about it's about accepting you, yeah. And mm -hmm. he's quite good at writing. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'll I'll check him out. Cool, man. We should jam too. That would be fun. Yeah, that'd be fun. I got basically a studio set up here. You know, drums and bass and guitar so yeah let's do it Sounds um, good. and maybe get a couple of other friends involved too but we don't have to wait on them because who knows when that'll happen so yeah we can just get together and tell tell other people and if they come they come something like that love that yeah for sure cool man it's been fun thanks for taking me up on it and let's we just made it happen that was great <clears throat> this interview yeah uh, or hangout session really We'll do it soon. Uh, well, well, we'll do it on another in another format. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cool. All right, man. Have a great night, and uh, thanks again. Okay. Okay, Alan. Take care.